a class, I'm Mrs. Adewale Yakubi. I'm here to take you on National Valley for GSS3 examination class. We'll be doing revision on the topic that says citizenship. We'll begin by defining what citizenship is. What is citizenship? Citizenship can be defined as a condition of being a member of a state, as a condition of, being, of having the legal status of being a member of that particular state. Who then is a citizen? A citizen is a legal member of a state. You can be a member of a state. You can be residing in a state. That does not make you a legal member of that state if you are not a citizen by, from that country. How do you now become a citizen of that country? Who then is a citizen? A citizen is a legal member of that country, either born in that country or nationalized in that country or has been married which we are going to be discussing subsequently for now let's define who a citizen is a citizen is a person or a legal member of a country with full constitutional rights when we say constitutional rights you know there are some rights in the constitution that are given to every individual of a country and if you are not a member of that country if you are not from that country, you may be missing out of those rights. So for you to enjoy those rights, you must be a citizen. So a citizen is a legal member of a country with the full constitutional rights and that he or she may be born or reside. Now let's start talk about the various types of citizenship. How can I become a citizen of a country? How can I enjoy those constitutional rights when I'm not a citizen? You can by doing the following means, by the following ways which we are going to be discussing today, which are types of a citizenship. One is citizenship by birth. A person can be a citizen of a country if your parents are citizens of that country. If you are born in that country, your mother or father is a citizen of that country, then automatically you are a citizen of that country. You may be residing in another country, you may be residing in London, you may be residing in the US, wherever you are residing. But so long your parents are born in that country, so long your parents are born in Nigeria, you are automatically a citizen by birth. Of, you are automatically a citizen of Nigeria by birth. But there should be there is a clause. You can be known, you can be recognized as a citizen. But if you are not properly registered, there should be a documentation because probably you were born outside Nigeria. But your parents are from Nigeria. But your parents are supposed to have all. They should register you with the national population census to give you a documentation, an ID card declaring you a citizen of a Nigeria. That is one way, way, one way by which someone can become a citizen of a country. Now, let's look at the second point. We said citizen by registration. A foreigner can become a citizen of a country by registration. This applies to three major persons. A foreigner can become a member of a, a citizen. For instance, an American that comes to Nigeria and stays in Nigeria, will you say such a person is a citizen because he's a foreigner in my country? No. How can, I be, how can that person become a citizen? For instance, if you are a male, a Nigerian man, married to a Nigeria, an American woman, automatically that American woman has become a citizen of Nigeria. By what? By marriage. So we can say that Citizenship can be acquired by marriage. It can be acquired by marriage. Also, the same way, if you or your wife, a woman that is a Nigerian, gets married to a foreigner, automatically that man is, will, become, will become a citizen of Nigeria by what? By marriage. So it's a dual way thing. Then a person can be a citizen whereby your, your parents are from that country. A person that is born in Nigeria. Probably your parents gave birth to you in Nigeria. They are foreigners, but you are born in Nigeria. You, the, the child that is being born in Nigeria, you're already a citizen of that country. Maybe your parents are from Ghana. They, 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 they are from Ghana, they migrated to Nigeria, and they've been living in Nigeria, and they've not gave birth. Your both parents are from Ghana. They brought you, they came to Nigeria and gave birth to you. Automatically, you are a Nigerian citizen. That child is not the parents, take note, is not the parents that are 
citizen. It's that child that is born in Nigeria that becomes a citizen of that country. So we can say that a person that is above 18 years of age who is born outside Nigeria by a Nigerian citizen is also a Nigerian. A child who is not a Nigerian, but adopted, when we say adopted, it's like a child that is being adopted, that, is, that they have a foster parents, that probably your parents are from Nigeria. Now they don't have they don't have any child of their own or they even have their own children but they like this Ghanaian child and they decide to adopt that Ghanaian child automatically that child has become a Nigerian citizen by what by adoption the child can have a dual citizen take note that does not make that child lost his or her own identity but it that child can be recognized as a citizen in Nigeria by what by adoption so that is the three ways by which we can become a citizen of a, a country. Now, let's look at citizenship by naturalization. Citizenship by naturalization can be given to a foreigner who has stayed in a country for a particular number of years. A foreigner, let's take an instance, in an Indian man that has stayed in Nigeria for over 15 years and above, that can speak Igbo, that can speak Aousa, that has been law-abiding, he has he has done so many things for the country he has he has he, he loves nigeria he loves the affairs of nigeria and he has stayed in the country can be given citizenship and that is known by that is known as citizenship by naturalization whereby a citizen is conferred on someone that has stayed in the country in a particular place for a longer period of a time so we can invariably say these are the three major ways by which someone can acquire citizenship. Let's take the types of citizenship. Note it down. One, we said citizenship by birth, citizenship by registration, and citizenship by naturalization. Now, let's look at the qualities of a good citizen. What are the qualities of a good citizen? What makes me a good citizen? What makes you a good citizen? One, a good citizen must be law-abiding. A good citizen must have respect for those in authority. A good citizen must have respect for the constituted authority. A good citizen must obey the laws of the land. If you want to be recognized as a good citizen, you shouldn't be troublesome. You shouldn't be the one that breaks the law at every time. Then you'll be referred to as well a good citizen. A good citizen, number two, a good citizen should always take good care of public property. You see the running tap. You see a tap running. Ah, because it's not for me. It's public tax. Government will come and fix it. Wait, why are you waiting for government to fix it? You can fix it. So if it's something you can fix, lock the tap to prevent it from running. You see the, tap, the, the, the drainage that is wasted away. You bring your dustbin, you dump into the drainage, and government will come and pack it. Is it government that does everything? For you to be a good citizen and a law-abiding citizen, whenever you see government properties that are going bad, Pick it because it's you and I that we enjoy the properties tomorrow. A good citizen must be ready to defend his or her own country whenever he or she is called upon. You are called upon. A tr trouble is happening in your area. Let's take our locality for instance. Let's forget about the larger in, uh, community. Let's take our close community for instance. How well do you protect your community? How well do you protect your, your, the, re, the reservation in the community? How well do you protect the plants that have been planted, the flowers, the things that have been planted? When you are called upon that something is happening in your locality, how well do you come out to represent it? How well can you say, oh, no, I'm going to stand for my community. I'm going to defend my community from an intruder. How well? That we are talking about the small community we are in. If we can start, if we can start from the our own various little community, do our own ways, contribute our own little effort, we will make Nigeria a better place. And you will be termed as a good citizen of a Nigeria. Now, a good citizen should be show respect for national symbol of his country. What are those national symbols? Your currency, your national item. You see, you have your currency, instead of putting your money in your purse, you squeeze your money, you write your name on it. You are not a good citizen. A good citizen must show respect for your national symbol. When you are, whenever you, are, you go to a foreign place and you are having the Naira with you, anybody that sees you with the Naira will know automatically that this person is a Nigerian. Mind you, we are talking about the qualities of a good citizen. When you are faced with such a question in your exam, 
we are asked what are the qualities of a good citizen one you should know that a good citizen should be law abiding a good citizen should always have good care for the public property a good citizen must be ready to defend his or her nation if you can give at least four basic points when you are asked what the qualities of a good citizen then you are good to go now let's look at the meaning of right of a citizen probably you are asking an exam what is the right of a citizen first of all what is the right of a citizen you can't tell me that the right of a citizen is the privilege recognized by society those amenities those basic things that governments are to give to you those are your rights those basic amenities that are being provided by government those are your rights so we can say that rights are those privileges, amenities, that are being given to citizens by their governments. That is our right. Now let's talk about the duties, because there is a difference between duties and a right. If you are asked in an exam, don't conflict your rights as your duties. Now let's look at duties. Duties means the responsibility which an individual is expected to give to his or her country. Mind you, there are two things rights and duties you'll be asked to differentiate between rights and duties if you are asked to differentiate between rights and duties how will you go about it first of all you define what right is and you define what community what duties are then you pick your differences and answer it you have it there to go so now let's look at it we said the right of a citizen refers to those privileges enjoyed by the citizen such as those basic amenities that government provides for the citizen. Now let's look at duties. We are now saying that duties are the responsibility which an individual ought to give to the government. And what are the duties of a citizen? One, you should be ready to vote when you are called upon. During the time of an election, you are asked to come and vote. You sit at home, I beg, I don't want to go and vote. It's, it is your duty to vote. If I don't vote, you don't vote, he don't vote, nobody will vote. There will be no election and there will be no good governance. So the right, the duties of a citizen, one, you come and vote. Payment of tax, that is a responsibility of a, good, of a, a good citizen. A citizen should have to pay his tax so that government can make amenities eh, ready for us. So now let's look at the importance of citizens' rights and their eh, duties. Why do we have, if you are asked, probably in an exam, to list the various importance of citizen rights and duties. One, social control. It serves as a giving check or regulates the human behavior and relationship between human in their society. Social control, the importance of citizen rights and their duties. Why is it important eh? for, the, for, for, for individuals, for a citizen to perform their duties? It brings about their eh, social control. It brings about peace. We're talking about the importance of their uh, citizens and their uh, citizens' rights and duties. It brings about peace. It brings about due process. It brings about their uh, discipline. If you are asking an exam, what are the importance of citizen rights and duties? One, you can, and more probably you have to explain further. Say social control itself as a guide to check or regulate human behavior and relationships between their uh, humans in the society. If you are asked such a question, please don't fail to answer that. Two, it brings about peace. The importance of citizen rights and duty, it brings about peace. When citizens carry out their duties, the government carries out its own, gives the citizens their own rights. There will be peace. Everybody will live in their harmony. Then it brings about due process. When citizens obey the law, there will be law and order. And government will have the time without having to divert funds to be settling conflict he will have time to bring about a uh, various uh, processes then it brings about discipline the performance and duties by citizens will create discipline in our community so from this let's give let's have a quick summary of what we have said so far one we, we started by defining the meaning of a uh, citizenship we said citizenship can be defined as a condition of being a member of a, a country. Then we now went further to discuss who is a citizen. A citizen is a legal member of a country with full constitutional rights. 
There we now talk about the types of citizens, whether we mention citizenship by birth, citizenship by registration, and citizenship by naturalization. We now talk about the qualities of a good citizen. What makes you a good citizen? We said a good citizen should be law abiding, a good citizen should always take care, good care of public property, a good citizen must be ready to defend it for her own nation, a good citizen should have respect for national symbols of his uh, country. Then we went further to discuss the meaning of right and uh, duty, whereby we told you that rights are those amenities that are enjoyed by citizens, then duties are those responsibility from citizens uh, to the country. So, and later we now talked about the importance of duties and uh, rights. We said that duties are rights, they bring social control. Duties, duties and rights, they bring peace to the community. Duties and rights, they bring due process and they bring discipline uh, to the community. When next we come, we meet again, we we'll discuss more on uh, more topics. Have a blessed day. Hello, my name is Uncle Rex, Biology is the subject and it's a revision class for senior certificate exams. And today we're going to be looking at practicals. Biology is a science subject and one of the distinctive features of any science subject is the practical aspect of it. And whether you like it or not, you are going to be examined on practicals, whether you have done such practicals or not. The objective of this class is to give you an advantage when you are writing such an exam. So first, let me tell you something. Every biology exam is normally going to be examined using three different papers. Paper one, paper two, and paper three. Paper one is what we call biology practical. And it is a school-based exam where WAEC will send what some students call a green paper to the school called a practical advice where the biology teacher is going to be told to get certain specimens prepared for the students. Now that takes about 70 marks or 80 marks and is going to last for two hours and the student is going to answer a minimum of three questions. It's an exam that every student can pass if he knows his onions. The second paper you're supposed to write is paper two. Paper two is normally called theory and objective. For the objective, you have 50 multiple choice questions and you are to choose the best alternative. And then, of course, you have the theory section. The theory section normally lasts for an hour and a half. That one, you have about six questions, you must answer three. It also carries about 60 to 70 marks. And then the last one is called paper three, which is alternative to practical. That is what students who are writing GC normally take. But let me tell you something. It's very easy for you to pass biology if you can do well in your practicals. And I'm here today to give you a good understanding and give you some tips with which you can use to pass any standard senior secondary examination as long as you're ready to listen. So what kind of questions can they ask you in biology practical? I want to give you the scope of the kind of questions they can ask you. The first question they will ever ask you in biology practical is an identification question. Identify the specimen. For instance, they may give you a frog and label it specimen A. Then they ask you, identify the specimen. And then what are you supposed to say? Specimen A 
is a frog. Hmm. If you want to get your mark, you need to tell me the scientific name for a frog. And the scientific name for a frog is Bufo regularis. So let me give you a tip. Each of you should find out the scientific names of the common animals around. A housefly is called Musca domestica. A cockroach is called Periplaneta africana. There's a sensitive plant. Once you touch it, it closes. It's called Mimosa pudica. An elephant is called Loxodanta africana. Loxodanta africana. Of course, you know man, human being is called Homo sapiens. Maize, what do we call maize? Z maize, you remember. Rice, Oriza sativa. Mango, try and remember. Cocoa, Theobroma cacao. So your first assignment, go and write down some of these scientific names. They will be very important for your identification. The second question they are going to ask you is a classification question. Classification is the same as taxonomy. So what is the classification? We have taxonomic ranks. We have seven taxonomic ranks you should be aware of. I have a little acronym I used to remember them. K-P-C-O-F-G-S. I'll take that again. K-P-C-O-F-G-S. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. So they can ask you, what is the family of this species? What is the genus of this species? What is the phylum? A good biology student, you should know that. That was what you did in the first year of your senior certificate course. So remember, you should also be able to tell them not only identification, but also classification. Another question that comes out a lot has to do with habitats. What's the habitat of a specimen? They give you a rat. What's the habitat of a rat? Will you say the habitat of the rat is in the house? No. What are the habitats we have? We have three kinds of habitats. Terrestrial, aquatic, and arboreal. But each of them have different subdivisions. So you must be very specific to get your answer. Another thing is you are going to be asked to draw during your biology practical. At least two drawings. So if I were you, get your drawing talent ready. And we don't need any artistic impression when you are drawing. Just draw what you see and label accordingly. And then another question they can ask you has to do with experiments. They can give you an experiment on osmosis, an experiment on reproduction, an experiment on respiration, and ask you to explain it. They can even bring a microscope and ask you, identify this scientific tool. What is it used for? How do you use it? So these are the kind of questions they can ask you during a biology practical exam. Now, when you come to biology practical, how do you answer the questions? I want to quickly give you some tips that will help you know how to answer biology practical questions correctly. Then at the end of that, we'll just take a look at one or two specimens and see how you can flow with it. Now, what are the guides first to making a good drawing? I told you, your drawing for in biology is non-negotiable. At least two drawings in section A and section C. So don't run away from drawings. If they give you specimen A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, go ahead and learn all the drawings. You don't know which of them they are going to tell you to draw. There was a wire question that came out where they gave the candidate specimen A to Q. That's a lot for them to read. So what are the guides to making a good biological drawing? Number one, you must use a pencil with a sharp tip so it doesn't produce woolly lines. Number two, you must draw with thin, clear, continuous lines. I've been a marker for a long time. And once we look at a diagram, we are going to write on it CL. CL means clarity of line. If your line is not clear, you get a zero. One mark has been lost. Another thing you need to learn how to do is you need to know how to pay attention to proportion. If you are drawing a fish, don't draw the head of the fish so big and the tail so small. Look at the proportion. Pay 
attention to proportions. Another thing you need to do, you must have very good labelings. Whenever you are labeling, let's say this is the specimen. If you are labeling like this, your label lines must be only on the sides, here and here. If you label here or here, you miss your mark. Then something also very important, every diagram must have a title. What did I say? Every diagram must have a title. And you always take your title from the question. They can give you a flower and ask you to draw the flower. So what is the title going to be? The drawing or a diagram of specimen A, if that's the name of the flower. Never make the mistake to call the specimen its name. Call it the same way the question always refers to it. Now these are just some little tips. Whenever you are doing your labeling lines, always use a pencil and a ruler. Make sure it touches the correct parts. These are little things, but remember, little forces spoil the vine. All these one-one marks that you get can help you do. And also remember to get a good understanding of the drawing. Where is the heart? Where is this, the leg? Once you can draw, make an attempt, you can do a lot better with that. So I also want to give you some tips that are going to help you to pass sort things. Let me just give you some tips. The first thing, number one, you must always confine yourself as much as possible to what you see. If they give you a frog as specimen B and they say give three characteristics, observable characteristics, who asks you to say the frog is pregnant? Did you see the baby? There are other characteristics you can mention. It has four legs. It has a rough or smooth skin. It has two eyes. So confine yourself much as possible to what you can see. Number two, I've mentioned it before. Don't name the specimen except you are asked to. Always refer to the specimen the same way the question refers to the specimen. Number three, obey instructions. Now this is very important. In biology, they can tell you to draw specimen A. 8 to 10 centimeters long. Before you start drawing, measure out 8 centimeters and measure out 10 centimeters. Then draw whatever you're drawing within that range. If not, you are going to lose one mark for the size of the diagram. Also, they may ask you to draw the side view, the back view, or the upper view. Every human being has different views. So whatever view you are asked to draw in biology, make sure you obey that instruction. Always obey instructions. Another thing that is very important is be concise in your answers. We know Mary is the mother of Jesus. Don't begin to tell us that Mary was married to Joseph uh, and that they were from Jerusalem. Mm -mm. Go straight to the answer. Most times, the question paper, they will give you an answer script and you have limited space. So just go straight to the answer. Not too long stories. What is specimen A? Specimen A is this. List four characteristics. Number one, this. Number two, this. Don't start writing story and say, I need more paper. Next, when you are giving a comparison question, always use a table. And when you are doing that, make sure that your comparison, they are tallying, they are sequential. Don't say specimen A has a head, specimen B does not have. If specimen A has a head and specimen B does not have a head, write it like there. It has a head, it does not have a head. If one of them are wrong, you lose your mark. And why isn't using your marks for anything? You are the one who needs it. So be very specific and careful when you're writing. Some students have asked me, do I use a pen or do I use a pencil? For your drawings, always use a pencil. But for any questions where you are writing, even your labelings, use a Bible. It's very, very important. And then you should also make sure that you always answer questions concisely. 
These are just some of the little things that you can know. In the next part of the class, I'm going to be showing you some specimens and then I'll give you, uh, just, just to show you the way they can ask these questions so that you can have a better understanding. Stay tuned, I'll be right back. I'm back again and I have in my hands a flower. Do you know the name of this flower? If you don't, you need to find out the name of at least three or four flowers we are going to be using in your senior certificate exams. But let me tell you, this flower in my hand is called Delonyx regia. It's called the flame of the forest. It's one of the most common flowers in tropical Africa and you need to know about this flower. Another one you may need to know is what we call Pride of Barbados. It's called Cesapina Puchera. And then one other one which is also important, I'm sure you know about that, Hibiscus. Those three flowers, you need to know about it. But let me ask you, what is a flower? Can you give me a good answer? It's very simple. The flower is the organ for sexual reproduction in plants. I'll take that again. The flower is the organ for sexual reproduction in plants. And what are the parts of the flower? Every flower has four parts. Let's take a look at this one in my hand. The first part is here. This is called the calyx. Then we have the corolla. Then we have these ones that we call the stamens. And lastly, we have this one that you call the style. So these are the parts of a flower. So please remember there are four parts of flower. Number one, calyx. Number two, corolla. Number three, stamen. Number four is simply gynosium. So you need to know them. These are normally called the petals. You have the sepals. And if you are given this in the exam hall, first question is going to be identify the specimen. So you say specimen A is a flower. And you need to tell us the name of that flower. And I told you the name of the flower is what? Delonyx regia. Or flame of the forest. Or you call it flamboyant flower. Then they can ask you, what is the biological significance of this flower? What are they asking you? What's the use? The importance of this is for reproduction. Please remember that. That's why it has all of this. These are the pollen grains. This is the stigma and the style. So as a good student, you should be able to tell them. In the exam, they ask them to remove all of these parts and then they ask them to draw it. So the question will always determine what they want you to do. They can ask you to draw this, or they can tell you to remove all of the stamens and draw this. Or they can just tell you to draw a complete flower like this. Any of them. So you need to get yourself ready concerning this. Let me take another specimen after this. This is another specimen. If they ask you to identify this, what will you say? A fish? If you say a fish, you are getting half of your mark. This is a bony fish. And this bony fish has a scientific name called tilapia zilai. That's how you get it. They can ask you, what is the habitat of this fish? What's your answer? Aquatic habitat. You get your mark. They can ask you, what class does specimen B belong to? What are you saying? You can't say vertebrates. What is it? It belongs to a class called Pisces. P-I-S-C-E-S. Your spellings must be correct to score. And then they can ask you, give four observable features 
that show that this belongs to the class you've mentioned? Very easy questions. You talk about the scales, talk about the fins, talk about the gills, you talk about the streamline shape, and then they can ask you, does it have an economic importance? Yes. It provides food. That gives you the economic importance. They can also ask you about adaptation. How is this adapted? You mentioned the gills, you mentioned the fins, you mentioned the streamlined shape. Another set of questions. Let me continue and bring one more or one or two more spe specimens for you to take a look at. This is specimen C. What would you call it? Yes, a gamma lizard. Very correct. What kind of habitat does it have? What are the observable features? Can you see its feet with claws? Can you see its dry, scaly skin? Can you see its long tails? Now, what if you are asked to state the differences between specimen C, which is a lizard, and specimen B, which is a bony fish? What are their differences? This has four legs. That doesn't have any legs. So that's the way you have to make use of your power of observation. What's the habitat for this arborea or terrestrial? So you need to know the habitat. You need to know its life cycle. You need to know what it eats. You need to know what eats it. These are different kind of questions you will need to do about that. These are the last two specimens we're going to be looking at. Specimen D and specimen E. If you are asked to identify them, what will you say? You can't say rice and beans. You eat rice and beans. This is biology practical. This is going to be grains of rice. And what is the scientific name for rice? Oriza and then these are the seeds of beans. If you just say beans, you're wrong. Now, what is the difference between a seed and a fruit? You should be able to tell us a seed has something and a, and a fruit is something else. So these are the kind of questions they can ask you. I'm sure during this class you've been able to understand a lot more about your biology practicals. Do yourself a favor and do some more reading. Find out the scientific names, the classifications, and I'll see you when next we see. I'm sure you're going to have a good time and a good result when you do write your SSE exams. See you later. Bye-bye.